Thank you, Simon. Uh, thanks to the audience. Thanks for joining us. I think we, we find ourselves at a very critical juncture uh, in terms of the world. And so it's a real pleasure talking to you. And I hope you find today's presentation insightful. I mean, Simon gave me a very long menu, geopolitics, inflation, interest rates, markets. So we're going to try and get through all of that. Uh, and if we don't, then obviously hit us up in the Q&A section and let's see how this goes. But let's have some, some fun unpacking a lot of what's happening in the world because there is a lot going on. Before I go there, just for those of you that aren't familiar with who I am, uh, my name is Mohamed Nala. Uh, I am South African. I used to live down in South Africa until fairly recently uh, and used to head up uh, macro at one of the large uh, investment banks down in South Africa, uh, then at uh, one of the large pension funds there as well. I'm a CFA charter holder, and I've been doing this for a while, so around 17 odd years of global markets experience. Uh, and real on the ground trading flow experience as well. So if you're a corporate and asset manager and you wanna, you wanna look me up, uh, go to monos.com, that's my website. Uh, if you're someone who's just interested in markets and you're looking for accessible insights, you can find my podcast uh, and other content on magic-markets.com. Uh, so that's just for you that don't know me yet. And of course, Twitter handle at Mohammed Nala. Without further ado, let's let's jump straight in. Uh, it's a very interesting time in the world, and I, I don't say that glibly. Uh, what I do say is that, you know, there's a lot that we've got to cover. We've touched on or will touch on geopolitics, uh, obviously Ukraine, Russia, front of mind, but also things that have maybe fallen a little bit to the back of the agenda. So what's happening with the U.S. and China? How do those two things connect? Uh, I like to always say let's use a wider lens when we're having that discussion. I will then segue from that into a general discussion on the economy, uh, you know, what are the risks from the fact that we're now in a rising interest rate environment, uh, and then the outlook for inflation and interest rates in general. Now, before we kick off, I'm going to show you a headline. And the headline says, a capital under siege and a population fleeing. And if you just consider that right now, you're going to think I'm talking about current affairs. Uh, I'm talking about the Ukraine. You know, Kiev is under siege right now. And, and certainly, Again, not to be glib, I think there's a lot of human suffering going out there. I'm going to say some things that are controversial on this particular session. And the reason for it is not to downplay any particular side. It's not to be partisan. It's so that we can provide a differentiated lens through which we look at things and we look at the data. Because at the end of the day, there's the humanity, the humanitarian component of it. And we obviously feel for any displaced population, the loss of life. But there's also the business and the market sides of things. And quite importantly, we need to try and separate those two when considering business and investing decisions. So this is actually what I'm referring to. If we go back just a year, just a year, over the course of 2021, and if I gave you that headline, this is what I would have been referring to, the US capital riots. Uh, the other one was the US fleeing Afghanistan and its own population fleeing Afghanistan. And if I keep that same headline and fast forward to today, you've got pictures of Kiev and you've got pictures of Ukrainian refugees. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that as soon as you widen the lens away from the noise and the headlines and the narrative that is prevalent at any given point in time, you start to see that human conflict and misery, unfortunately, is very widespread. It's just not always reported on in the same way. It's not always encapsulated in the markets in the same way. And I say, how is it different to this? I mean, you've got pictures there of Syrian refugees and Afghan refugees and African refugees and Asian refugees. And so all I'm saying is that these kinds of geopolitical risks have been with us for quite some time. It's, it's quite the shocking indictment on human nature in general. I, I, I covered something quite similarly when, when I looked at a stock called Lockheed Martin, which is an arms manufacturer. And I said that you could look at that and say, you know, you don't want to be involved in that. Or you could look at it and say, yeah, that is your hedge against the fact that humanity will always look to do their fellow man down kind, kind of thinking. So I don't want to get too bogged down in this. What I'm trying to say to you is that be sensitive to the narrative and the role that it plays and how that gets priced into markets, because it's not necessarily uniform depending on what or how the headlines refer to a particular aspect of what's going on. Let's contextualize risk a little bit better in a, in a geopolitical sense. So this is something that I found in the Alliance Risk Report, and it, it looks at two distinct periods. So it was a survey of a couple of thousand businesses globally, and it said, you know, how do you contextualize the most important risks for you 
in 2019, looking forward into 2020, and then again in 2020, looking forward into 2021. And so what you're looking at is the bars are telling you what the view was in 2020, and the arrows are telling you whether that improved or deteriorated from the prior period. And what stuck out for me here is if you look at things like climate change, natural catastrophes, and you can almost bucket those together, you can see that they don't preoccupy the minds of business leaders. And similarly, look at the one that's on the absolute right hand side, the tail risk there that was not adequately contextualized, and that's political risks and violence. And ironically, that's the world that we find ourselves in, not just globally, but I mean, South Africa having gone through similar risks that materialized in a terrible way in the middle of last year. So the reason I say this is quite often when contextualizing risk, we can't always plan for the tails, but you have to have them in your overarching framework of how you approach business and how you approach markets. Now, going back to my point about narrative and going back to how things can be viewed from a different lens, coverage, and, and perhaps I'm up in North America right now. I see a lot of pro North American, pro NATO narrative and headlines around the Russian Ukraine situation. So I actively go out there and I look for alternative data points. I say, how does this look from the other side of the proverbial wall? And this is something interesting. This is a, a, a satirist who operates in Russia. His name is, is, is Vitaly Podovitsky, and he does some pretty provocative stuff. This was a, a, a satire, a cartoon that was doing the rounds in Russia prior to this Ukraine conflict. And it shows you Uncle Sam with his NATO bag knocking on the doors of the neighbors, and you've got Iraq, and you've got Libya, and you've got Syria. And with Ukraine, you know, he knocks on the door and he's met by the Russian bear. Now, the reason I raise this is certainly not to glamorize the Russian narrative or not to glamorize the American narrative. I'm saying, look at the difference in perspective, is that in Russia, this is posed or put forward as a provocation by NATO that has just gone roughshod through other neighborhoods and Russia saying, we're not gonna let them do that in our neighborhood. And I think that differentiated narrative is very important when trying to contextualize risks and plan for them accordingly. So let's look at some hard facts now. What you're looking at now is effectively NATO over the ages. So the dark teal on this chart, on this map, shows you what NATO was at its founding. And you can see that during the Cold War, that expanded. So it included the likes of Spain and Turkey, for example. And then most recently in the post-Cold War, that's the very light teal, you can see that NATO has literally expanded all the way through to its current borders. It's on the borders of Ukraine, of Russia. And if you're sitting and if you're NATO, you see this as your, as your reason for existence. It's, it's defending Western democracies and freedoms. And if you're Russia, you see this as provocation. And you've got to cast a, a wider lens and say that in the original intent, when NATO was formed uh, and when the Soviet Union fell, the, the, the agreement was that Germany, for example, would be brought into NATO and shortly after West Germany was incorporated, then East Germany or Germany unified and Germany was incorporated. And today we find ourselves with a NATO that looks very different to the NATO at its founding. Now, I wanna say, how does the Ukraine fit into the entire NATO situation? For those of you not familiar, it's very important to give you the context. Now, this is back in 2008, the Bucharest summit, NATO summit, and I fact checked this. So for those of you that I'm very sensitive to fake news, it's very difficult to know what you can trust, how good is data. So there's the link to NATO's website in terms of the official declaration that was made at the Bucharest summit in 2008. And this is clause number 23. And if you read it, it explicitly says that NATO welcomes the Ukraine and Georgia's Euro Atlantic aspirations for membership and they agreed that those countries will become members of NATO. This was in black and white back in 2008. Now things have changed back in 2010, the Ukraine shelved its plans to be part of NATO because of political pressures, they had a change in government and then reprioritized it in 2014, after which this really continued to escalate. So this is giving you the background of NATO saying to the Ukraine, we've got you, you're part of us, you're part of the club. And unfortunately, we, I mean, even if we fast forward to today, as recent as the tail end of last year, 
know, Russia was, was raising the red flag and saying, you know, if, for example, NATO positions weapon systems in the Ukraine, their concern at that stage is that a hypersonic missile would take only five minutes to reach the Russian capital of Moscow. And so that's why it was a red line for Russia. And NATO's response at the time, I think fairly antagonistic in some respect, was that it's only Ukraine and NATO that decides when Ukraine is ready to join NATO. Russia has no veto, Russia has no say, and Russia has no right to establish a sphere of influence to try and control their neighbors. And so I think if you see that, that's strong language. You know, this was the latter part of last year, after which a lot of this has escalated. So unfortunately, I see this as NATO in many respects leaving the Ukraine out to dry. We've had, uh, you know, the, the president of the Ukraine, Zelensky, making an appeal to Canadian parliament up here and to US Congress just yesterday uh, and to the German government today saying, give us air support, give us actual boots on the ground. And NATO is a little gun shy, understandably so. They don't want an escalation. But this was building for quite some time. If you look at military expenditures, that's the chart I put on there. Again, hard data, and you can go and find this. So this is from the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, and they do a lot of good work. So you can go and check them out. But you can see how military expenditure in Eastern Europe and Asia have ballooned over the previous two consecutive five-year periods. And you can see that even on the Ukraine, it took up around 4% of GDP. So that's telling you that these tensions are not new, that they've been on the horizon and yet had not featured very prominently because people just did not contextualize the risk appropriately, myself included. I think, you know, Simon and I were chatting earlier this year in terms of does this escalate into a much more full-blown conflict? And at that point in time, my view was no. And I just think, Things have shifted. We assume rational actors on all sides of the on all sides of the coin right now. And unfortunately, in very fluid events like this, even if you've contextualized the risks appropriately, there are these tails that continue to drag on for much longer. Now, I want to zoom out from the Ukraine and just say that this is about projection of power. And I'm going to throw this image up there just again for a little bit of light humor, saying, hey, look, mom, it's Europe. Uh, now, I say it's light humor in that, you know, there's the Europe that we all know, but if you included all of the European territories around the world, it's this little red squiggly thing that you get. Now, I say that loosely, but if I get more serious about this and we say, okay, what is projection of power? What does it really look like? What does a multipolar world look like after this era of effectively being a very unipolar Euro and American centric world for the last several decades? And this is the hard data. So it's certainly a less, much less colorful chart, less fun chart, if you want to call it that. But what you're looking at here in black and white is the US military presence around the world. And every dot there represents a US base or bases that contain US troops. And if you look at this, and, and I'll point you to some interesting books to read at the tail end of this ge geopolitical section, the US is, for all intents and purposes, still an imperial power. And it has had the ability to be the world's only superpower for the last several decades after the fall of the Soviet Union. But that is something that is constantly in flux. And it is why we see this push and pull factors between old powers like Russia, where for, again, economically, it's, it's a shadow of its former self, but militarily, it's still reasonably powerful. And then the emerging powers like a China, which on a PPP basis is the world's largest economy and militarily is starting to grow in strength and prominence, uh, prominence and assertiveness. So that's what projection of power looks like. It's not just military power, it's cultural power, it's economic power. And that leads me onto this point, is that in the current situation, the world's biggest weapon has been unleashed. And humanity has been very inventive, like I said earlier, about finding ways of hurting one another. And the world's biggest weapon is not really what you think. It's this, it's the US dollar, it's financial markets. And what we've seen, I think, in a very different sense in the current conflict is that Western powers have leaned a lot more heavily on the weaponization of markets. And that's going to change the way the world works. Now, what I mean when I say that is that we're not just talking about imposition of sanctions. We've seen that, we've seen that in the past. It's debatable whether sanctions work, whether they are effective, whether they just hurt the population versus the elite. 
Those are all valid points. But what we've seen that's different here is that internationally trusted systems like SWIFT, for example, which is a system that allows you to wire money around the world. SWIFT was cut off to Russia. Large payment networks like MasterCard and Visa were cut off in Russia. And this is the first time something like this has actually happened. So when I say it changes the way the world works, my, my biggest concern is that it erodes certain institutions that had built up trust amongst global players, whether they were politically aligned or not. And by weaponizing those institutions, unfortunately, you break the trust in the system and you almost create the fracture points that lead you to a much more multipolar world that is inherently less stable. Now, there's obviously the economic impact here that is obvious. There's the impact, for example, on resources that both Russia and the Ukraine provide for the rest of the world. So in the case of the Ukraine, for example, it's wheat. You know, wheat, we spoke about this again with Simon earlier on in the year, is filtering through very quickly in terms of food prices and food inflation. And there's some scary charts in terms of how those soft commodity prices have ratcheted up. There's the hard com commodities like platinum group metals, palladium in particular. Uh, and not a lot of people know this, but if you look at the Ukraine, the Ukraine supplies a very large portion of neon for the global semiconductor market. And so that, for example, becomes a further pressure point on supply chains. And we can touch on all of these points in the, in the Q&A section. There's also the potash and fertilizer that then has a much longer tail to food inflation over the longer term. Lastly, and I think quite importantly, is that the weaponization of markets in this particular context has also meant the freezing of a country's, a sovereign country's foreign exchange reserves. Now, Russia, and a lot of people know this, but if you broke it down in terms of the largest foreign exchange reserve holders in the world, Russia was all the way up there. You know, they had somewhere in the region of around $430 billion worth of foreign exchange reserves. And about 140 of that was in gold, the rest in dollars and euros and, and other currencies. And the FX reserves held in other currencies have been frozen. The gold reserves are currently still technically fungible, but there's a, an act or a, you know, a motion being passed in the US uh, House, uh, or maybe Congress in general, that they would like to suspend Russia's ability to use that gold by labeling it blood gold. And so again, this starts to raise a lot of questions of what does weaponization of financial markets do in terms of are they effective in reigning in bad characters, bad actors, or do they just further fracture the world and create further instability? Now, quickly to move towards wrapping up the geopolitical section, cognizant of time, there's China in all of this. And interestingly enough, China initially appeared to give Russia their blessing, depending on, again, which newspaper report you read. Uh, China subsequently came out and said, no, we actually want them to, to peacefully resolve the situation. But I want to look at China and say, China's played this remarkably well. If you look at China over the course of the last several decades, again, a wider lens, the chart on the left shows you how prominent China has become from a trade perspective, just in Africa. Uh, if you look at the Chinese actions towards global central banks, they've extended swap lines to make it easier to trade with China in renminbi, the Chinese yuan. China has an alternative to payment systems like MasterCard and Visa, and that's China's union pay. Uh, they have an alternative to WhatsApp, which is WeChat. Um, so, this shows you that internally, China's looked to build some resilience. And the question mark is whether they use these opportunities to project some of that power more globally. I'm gonna wrap up on geopolitics quickly and just to tell you that, again, if you're interested, geopolitics is all about perspective. And, and these are some interesting reads because history doesn't repeat itself, but it definitely does rhyme. And if you're interested in a couple of good books that I've read over the course of the last several years, you know, Civilization, The West and the Rest by Niall Ferguson gives you a balanced view of kind of the US-China interplay. Uh, similar with Why the West Rules for Now, slightly more balanced reads there and maybe a little bit more West-centric. Something like Oliver Stone's Untold History of the United States, fascinating reading, maybe leans slightly more to the left there. And then something I've read, written by a friend of mine, uh, Marco Papik, and he's written a book called Geopolitical Alpha. And that's a nice book in terms of how do you contextualize geopolitical risks? How do you build it into your frameworks and models when considering investing? Uh, so I just, I'll leave that with you and move from that very quickly into the economy. Um, I'll, I'll make this joke. Uh, economists have several views because it's better to be 
roughly right than precisely wrong. So I can guarantee you one thing, you know, not, not everyone knows everything at all time, even though the, you know, the name of my, my business is Mo Knows, that's said a little bit tongue in cheek, uh, in that it's about dialogue. It's about constant learning, which is why we're having this, this chat today. Quickly on the economy, I'm gonna flick through a couple of slides quickly because I'd rather deal with a lot of this stuff in the Q&A section. But we had a terrible pandemic 2020, and that saw a rebound in 2021. So this is IMF data. And unfortunately, into that rebound, you know, naturally economies mature, monetary policy cycles reverse, uh, but the pandemic hasn't gone away. And now we find ourselves with geopolitical risks that are very extended and that run the risk of exacerbating inflation, tighter monetary policy because of that inflation and a reversal of what has thus far been a reasonable rebound out of what has been probably the worst global historic event in recent times being the COVID pandemic. Now, if we look at data, hard data again, I like to use heat maps, and this shows you where the pressure points are. So again, we can just touch on this, but you can see that, for example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, you've got growth, which is your red flag point. If you look at the likes of Turkey, it's inflation. We've seen what's happened with the Turkish lira and political meddling in their monetary policy. And so inflation and interest rates are your flashpoint in Turkey, for example. Um, if you looked at Russia, remember this data predates the, the, the conflict that we're seeing, but Russia, interestingly enough, was running a, a, a nice current account surplus. That's because of the energy exports and so forth. Jobless rate was reasonably well contained. Debt to GDP was okay, but the GDP was starting to slow. And then there's the geopolitical risk on top of that. So heat maps like this show you what some of the pressure points are from a high kind of helicopter level. And I'm not going to touch too long on this point. This is COVID. I wanted to raise it simply because we've seen renewed lockdowns in China. We've seen Hong Kong, for example, coming under severe lockdowns. And this, again, go and look at our world in data, some great data out there looking at the severity of lockdowns. What I'm going to show you here is, is South Africa at the instance, at the first instance of COVID, had one of the most severe lockdowns on the planet and then subsequently eased that back quite nicely. And if you look at the likes of China or New Zealand or even Canada until very recently, those were quite severe, quite stringent, and that does represent a cap on economic growth. Uh, I just wanna flag this because it's not gone yet. Uh, so don't let COVID fall out of your narrative, out of your frame of reference. Unfortunately, as the world moves towards anti-masking or less masking, um, a lot of people tend to be vaccinated. There's vaccine equity, which is another point that we can discuss. Unfortunately, this might have a slightly longer tail than a lot of people are currently pricing in, simply because they're preoccupied with a lot of the other headlines that are going on. Let's move from this into inflation. I can show you the scary charts, and the one on the left is Brent crude, and the one on the right, that's wheat futures. We spoke about wheat and soft commodity prices. But the point I want to impress on you is that the prices have spiked. We get this. It's incredibly concerning. And the question mark is how sustained are these moves in prices? And if the conflict in the Ukraine persists for longer or even escalates and worsens, this can stay sustained for a much, much longer period. But in the same vein, and to give you the flip side of that argument, I like to raise again the prospect or the concept that inflation is a rate of change. When policymakers are looking at inflation, they are looking at a rate of change and they are basing their decisions around interest rates, for example, on a rate of change. Now, why do I raise that? Is if you look at the chart on the left-hand side, the purple line is the Brent crude oil price in dollar terms. The green line is effectively a year-on-year -year percentage change in that same oil price. And if you cast your eye to 2011 to 2014, you can see that we had that big push up in oil prices above 100, oil prices stayed there. But if you look at the green line, you can see that it spiked initially and then came all the way back down towards zero and eventually went negative. And that point shows you that it's a rate of change. It's why the entire debate around is inflation transitory or not was even there in the first place, is that in normal circumstances, if it's just a reaction to higher prices, the cure for higher prices are higher prices. And if prices adjust upward and stay there, your rate of inflation spikes and subsequently comes back down. It doesn't mean you pay less for the good. It means that the inflation rate spikes and comes back down again. What we are seeing right now, though, and the chart on the right that you're looking at there is a measure of supply chain tightness, of logistical tightness. Uh, it's the fully fed's delivery time index. 
And we can see that supply chains are still tight. They probably are going to be exacerbated by what we're seeing on the geopolitic uh, front. Uh, we've got energy prices that remain very tight. Russia accounts for 10% of the world's oil production uh, and roughly about 5 or 6% in and of itself of the global oil supply because obviously of its, of its 10%, it utilizes around 4%, 4 to 5% of its own oil domestically. So these are some of the pressure points. Regardless of that, US inflation expectations have actually stayed pretty well anchored. They haven't ratcheted much above 2.4%. And that's remarkable, given the amount of monetary stimulus we've seen in the system, given the pricing pressures we've seen coming through very quickly in terms of shelf prices as well. And so this tells you that, by and large, respondents on the survey, being businesses and consumers and so forth, are reasonably confident that monetary policy or policymakers will step in to control inflation. Now, it's still quite fresh. We had the Fed yesterday, so you will forgive the quality of this particular chart simply because uh, I just pulled it off Bloomberg, I put it on here. This is something called the Fed dot plot. And it shows you where the federal FOMC members see rates going over the course of the next several years. Now, I'll start off by telling you, point blank, this is usually wrong. Now, why would I show you something that's usually wrong is that they tend to capitulate and extrapolate at the wrong times. If you look at this over a period of time, they were too sanguine when price pressures were starting to build. So they're behind the curve. Now, if you look at it, it's quite elevated and it's projecting a much steeper hiking cycle. And reality is probably going to be somewhere between where we are now and what you're seeing on this dot plot, simply because things will come through in that tighter policy will constrain price increases. That if, the, if there's some sort of resolution in the Ukraine, that will all obviously exacerbate that and we might see prices come down again. But this shows you that the Fed tends to be a little bit behind the curve. They've dropped the wording on transitory. Uh, but for now, if you look at their projected five additional increases this year, uh, that might be seen as quite aggressive by some. Where are we in the cycle? This is always debatable. So I throw this up as a conceptual schematic just for people to conceptualize that the markets and the economies don't always move in lockstep. And so the question mark for me now is that, do we move into a tighter early recession kind of environment with much tighter monetary policy? And the question there is, how aggressively do central bankers go? We had the Fed yesterday hiking by 25, saying there's another five coming during the course of this year, sounding very hawkish. We had the BOE today hiking, but sounding a lot more dovish. And so maybe there's this divergence between Europe and the US, and that's also what we're likely going to see in terms of economic growth over the course of the last year and going forward into the next two years. Bringing it back home to South Africa, the RAND has been remarkable. It's outperformed its, its EMFX peers. Uh, the chart on the left includes, uh, obviously, the likes of Turkey and Russia. And so if I exclude those, you can see that, you know, you take some of that volatility out. South Africa has done relatively well compared to its peer group. And so, you know, I think the only one that's really outperforming South Africa has been Brazil, again, the beneficiary of resource prices where they are right now. And this stronger performance on the currency has also come through in terms of South African markets in dollar terms, where South Africa has actually outperformed a lot of its peers. A lot of that return, however, certainly for the year to date, as we see now, so call it two and a half months, has been driven by the FX move being stronger and not necessarily by, by, by markets that are a lot higher than, for example, the sell-off we've seen in global markets. Lastly, and just to kind of wrap the argument, the EM rate cycle, the Saab had commenced hiking interest rates in the latter part of last year, but they are a lot further behind the curve than other uh, emerging market central banks. I've excluded Russia from this particular chart on the left simply because they, they just recently hiked in, in this turmoil. They've hiked to north of 20%, and so it does skew the chart a little bit. But if you look at South Africa, still on the low side, uh, and this means that there is still some scope for South Africa to go relative to some of the other emerging markets. Why is this important? Is that there's this thing called the carry trade. And so in order to compensate investors for being invested in South Africa with whatever the South African risk premium is and the inflation there, you would need to effectively compensate them with higher interest rates. And so this filters through quite nicely in terms of the outlook for the currency. A chart on the right, it's more global. It's the US yield curve. And why I raise this as a parting point is that when this inverts, so when this goes below that zero line, that's usually an indication, not a guarantee, but an indication of recession risks. 
Now we saw it ironically there in negative territory just before the pandemic. Then the pandemic happened. It's obviously ratcheted up. It's now subsequently started coming back down, but we need to keep an eye on this because if they start to hike rates very aggressively in the US, you're likely gonna see that line head a lot closer towards zero. And that starts to indicate a yield curve that is inverting and the risk of potential recessionary conditions. I wanna wrap up by saying life analysis, the way you look at the world is all about perspective. And perspective is very important because if you're the guy on the island waiting to be rescued, you see a boat, you're very excited. And if you're the guy on the boat and you've been drifting at sea for days and days without any food and you see the island, you're very, very excited as well. So I hope that's a nice place to leave it is that life, life is about what do you get excited about and what shouldn't you get excited about? And Simon, I think that's a great place to leave our discussion and move into Q&A. Cool, that's perfect. Folks, if you've got questions, drop them into the, the Q&A box. Uh, I've got a, a bunch coming through already, some coming on Twitter. Uh, Zifuf Butelezi saying, excellent presentation, uh, well balanced. Uh, a couple coming through here, a question on uh, Neon. What's it used for? Where's it from? Mohammed, as I understand, it's coming out of Odessa, if I remember correctly. Um, and it's basically the clean rooms for making the chips. It's not a component of the chip, but you need a 100% a, a, a clean room to do it. And that's the problem. Absolutely right, Simon. I, I think that sums it up quite nicely, is that when you look at semiconductor foundries, so let's maybe even backtrack. What are semiconductors? Mm -hmm. uh, semiconductors or semiconductor fabrication are the microchips that go into pretty much everything we use. So I'm, I'm not even talking about high tech stuff. If yeah. you look at your toaster today or your kettle, mm -hmm. those have microchips in them. Your cars have microchips. And so I always call it the new oil, right? In that there's semiconductors and microchips in everything we need. Uh, they produce these in factories that they call foundries, incidentally. And those factories need to be these hyper sanitized environments. Neon effectively is the gas or the, 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 uh, the um, the, the, the element is utilized in that process in terms of, so it's not in the semiconductor, but it's in terms of ensuring the environment in which those semiconductors are, are manufactured. Uh, question coming through around your point on COVID, um, that, that it's, and it, maybe it is starting to become uh, uh, endemic more than in pandemic. We can debate that. But the point is, we've seen just this last week, uh, uh, China locking down uh, Shenzhen and the like. This is going to, the question is, this is going to put more pressure on supply chains, albeit companies are perhaps better positioned. I know when I chat with CEOs recently, they've all increased inventory levels and that that's their way of, of, of managing as best they can. But whereas we'd kind of hoped supply chains would be back to normal, certainly by Christmas, maybe not quite normal just yet. Yeah, so... Again, I think we need to break that down into two components, right? I think uh, I want to cast my, our, our listeners' minds back to the chart I showed you very early on in the presentation in contextualizing risks. You know, COVID was obviously the biggest risk mm -hmm. uh, and or one of the biggest risks that were contextualized by business people. And that had escalated from the 2019-2020 to the 2020-2021 outlook. Uh, now, when I say escalated in terms of how relevant it was to their business, yes, you can bulk up your inventories as part of a risk mitigant. But the fact of the matter is that doing business in post-COVID times comes with additional costs. So it's a question mark of how do we go about it? You know, we, we went through an era of lots of sanitization and masking and, you know, cohorting your production line staff and, and that kind of stuff, which meant that goods got out a lot slower. It meant that there were less staff at work. And now, depending on where you are, China has gone quite hard at this, there are lockdowns there. But if you look at Western, if you look at Western Europe, France, if you look at North America, Canada in particular and the US, there's the whole thing of removing mask mandates. There's the whole thing of getting back to normal. And so it's where are we in the cycle? Because if we do that up here in North America, for example, and the numbers start to spike and we get a replay, kind of what we're seeing in China, but just a little bit later on, then we go back to lockdowns and we go back to production constraints. And there's already tightness in terms of production and logistics. So it does exacerbate supply chain issues. And I think it has, or the point I wanted to raise there is that it has a longer tail in terms of the drag it could place on global growth. And maybe that's not particularly encapsulated simply because a lot of the near-term data around inflation and growth has been propped up by these massive stimulus measures that have come through in some of your larger economies. Yeah, I like that. Your point around economic one, I really liked it in the sense, and I hear what you say where 
you know, for example, the 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 the, 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 the central bank reserves. I mean, that that, that was unheard of, um, and and it has been, you know, the as you say, certainly impacting the people, the, the Russians on the ground. Does it impact the oligarchs? Does it impact Putin and his inner circle? Probably not. Uh, certainly not to the degree. The question coming through is: Does this potentially weaken the U.S. and strengthen China? And 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 the 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 the, the, the put they put onto it is that China's kind of been using economics. The illustration you showed of Africa, the Bolton Way initiative and the like, they've been kind of slowly taking over the world using money rather than military power. I think it's a great question. And it, it, it's, it's actually been one of those key focal areas. We've spoken about it. Uh, I mean, in fact, I'm moderating a panel with the, the CFA Toronto Society in a couple of weeks time discussing is China still investable? And you know, there's a lot going on in China. So let's let's first of all rewind to the initial part of your question, which is mm. central bank reserves. You know, yeah. weaponizing those for me is is quite damaging. You know, it's very damaging in that you know you're eroding the trust in a, a system that has been in place for several decades now. And I'm going to make reference to a term called the petrodollar here. So let's maybe introduce that concept to to listeners that are not familiar with that. Is that from around the 1970s? We've had the, 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 the petro states, Russia, the Middle East, OPEC, effectively running massive surpluses. Those surpluses get recycled into U.S. treasuries. It keeps the cost of funding in the U.S. really nice and low. And so this nice, and, and the U.S. then buys more of that oil. And it's yeah. a nice circular reference. So it keeps everyone nice and happy. And commodities, in particular oil being the largest commodity, commodities are priced in U.S. dollars, but it's where this term of the petrodollar comes about. The current juncture where we find ourselves sees Russia speaking to the likes of China to price oil in Yuan, for example, because they sanctioned and they can't get their oil out anywhere else. It's got the likes of the Middle Eastern players saying, can we trust the US that recently have become unreliable bedfellows? You know, we've had a very antagonistic relationship between the US, for example, and the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia. You know, uh, I saw a, an article not so long ago saying that the, the, the road outside the Saudi embassy in Washington was going to be named after Jamal Khashoggi. So you know, that kind of tit for tat does not leave um, a nice taste in the mouth of, 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 of certain geopolitical spheres. And so it starts to erode the trust in the petrodollar system. It starts to, I think it's early days. I'm not calling the demise of the dollar. Uh, what I do think is that China has been very adept in extending bilateral swap lines to their trading partners. And so in a world where people want to start transacting in Chinese yuan, China is poised to take advantage of that. So to answer the, 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 the listener's question, does this play into China's advantage? I certainly think so. I think China always has played this with a much longer term lens. They're not gonna get drawn into little you know, regional spats. They're gonna try and benefit and play the long game. And I see this, plays towards a Chinese strength over the longer term. Yeah, and there was a conversation I had with someone last year. He said, you know, China looks at the arc of their of their history over millennia, four of them. Um, and and the last, you know, 150 years since the opium wars, it's it's a blip on their on 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 their horizon, you know, and, and they worried about the next thousand years. And, and a couple of questions are then coming out. Lance Peter both sort of talking around the dollar. Do we start to see Come on, and I know there's been moves before to price commodities in another currency. Do we start to see reserves moving away from the dollar into into the China into China into uh, maybe into the euro, or, or is there you know almost nowhere to hide? Because of course the problem is if we put all our reserves in Czar, that's great unless the Czar collapses, which you know if if we were invading Lesotho, although when we tried that, we lost. But, but you know, if, if, if we were the target of global sanctions, our currency collapses, and our, then you want your reserves in a, in a strong currency. Where does it leave the dollar? Yeah, I mean, something recent. Uh, Russia had two euro bonds on which payments were due. Yeah. And uh, Russia didn't want to be in default. So they said, oh, well, we'll pay this in rubles, because if we do that, we're technically not in default. So I think we're testing. The resilience of that dollar as, as we speak. Um, if you look at it with a wider lens, you know, the fact that reserves, whether they're in dollars or euros, can be frozen uh, may mean that if a central bank, if a government wanted to park its reserves in another fiat currency, the Chinese yuan might be that currency. But again, then you are beholden 
to risks of the Chinese deciding to either freeze or unfreeze your reserves. Um, for the gold purists, they'll tell you, well, this is exactly why yeah, so reserves my next should point. be gold. This right? is why it should be gold. Uh, <laughs> why it should be gold. And, and, and it's why this development around declaring Russia's gold as black. I mean, if you go and look at Russia and gold reserves over the last 10 years, they've been growing their holdings of gold reserves at 10 to 15 percent compounded annual growth rate. OK, it's, it's wow. phenomenal. So Russia has been aggressively building up the gold reserves because maybe that was the thinking is we don't want to be beholden to these other powers. If the US is successful in marking Russian gold as blood gold, and I don't know how they would be, but we need to see how that goes. Then the question mark is how do we find a depoliticized global reserve currency? And this either plays into IMF SDRs or again, the crypto purists are going to say to you, this is exactly why you need Bitcoin or this is why you need Ethereum or whatever it may be. Uh, if I was asking, he says 40% of all US money printed in the last two years. I actually think it's a high, is it 40% my bit or is it actually, I, I actually saw a chart, but I can't remember what the time duration is. But certainly, I mean, they've printed a, a huge amount of US dollars in the last couple of years and all the way back to to the the GFC in in 2008, um, and and managed to hold their position as the world's reserve currency, notwithstanding if anyone else, if we did it, we would just have you know rampant inflation. Yeah, so so this is an interesting one as well because it's it's the exorbitant privilege. You know, being the world's reserve currency means that you have access to the world's yeah. capital for free for generations. Yeah, uh, and potentially yes, that is being abused, but. Let's rewind. I mean, I'm, I'm old enough to remember the time before the global financial crisis. I was in markets back yeah. then. And if you looked at the Fed's balance sheet, it was under a trillion dollars. It was a couple of hundred, a couple of hundred billion dollars, but it was under a trillion, certainly. And then we went into the global financial crisis and they introduced quantitative easing. And, you know, effectively, you want to call it money printing. It's debatable whether it's really money printing or dropping it in. And, and I'll, I'll separate those two at the tail end of my comment here. So QE effectively printed money that then got trapped in the financial system and the Fed's balance sheet ballooned. So as we went into financial crisis or post financial crisis, the balance sheet kind of tapped out around the $4 trillion mark. Then they went with quantitative tightening. So they slowly let that run off. So they just didn't reinvest. And then from the time they allowed the runoff to the pandemic, you know, we've then seen this pandemic supercharge it. And the last number I saw was just shy of $9 trillion on the face balance sheet so 40 percent or not it's from the global financial crisis at four to nine right now that number sounds more or less in the right kind of ballpark and that's based on publicly available data it's it's why i also like to look at something called the the shadow rate now maybe it's less of a feature now that the feds actually started hiking interest rates but mm -hmm. if you go on to fred uh, which is the st louis uh, feds portal and you go and search for the Wuxia shadow rate, it shows you what is the implied or the effective policy rate in the US. And you saw that getting very easy into substantially negative territory for quite some time. And so the tighter monetary policy that you're seeing now in terms of the movement of the Fed funds rate is actually something that's been with us in the shadow rate for some time. And so just keep an eye on some of those dynamics. The last point I wanted to raise around helicopter money is that only post the COVID pandemic did we see what true helicopter money looks like in the way in the way I call it in the West. We saw it in Germany. Germany is technically in the West, right? We saw it in, in Weimar Germany, but we saw it in modern times in the US following the COVID pandemic because they were physically mailing checks to people to go and get them to spend. And they didn't really spend. They went and YOLO'd that on Robin Hood and, 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 and GameStop and a whole bunch of stuff. But that was in my in my context, at least the truest sense of helicopter money. And I guess it's part of why we're sifting through these market dislocations today. Yeah, no, I think you're right on that. And, and for the listeners there, there was a brilliant Planet Money podcast about a week or two ago on, on Bretton Woods, which is where the whole sort of post-war, and then of course Nixon left it, but and, and uh, uh, John Maynard Keynes, who was trying to get a global currency that wasn't the dollar. Because he saw he saw the massive advantage to the U.S. if it was the dollar, um, and Keynes he didn't so much lose the debate. He kind of got hoodwinked. But Planet Money, go go find that podcast. And Paul's asking, yeah, you know, classic 
investing. I'm going back to when I was a teenager in the 80s and my grandfather was helping me understand markets. And he would say to me, when interest rate cycles move higher, equity markets move lower, if not for the simplest reason, because if there's an interest rate of, let's say, 7%, I can put my money in the bank and get a guaranteed 7%. I put it in the equity market, I might get seven, I might get 12, but it does, it sucks part of the market into the, into the, into the interest rate market. Is that still a fair view where, where we see the rising rates? I mean, and let's be clear, rising rates are going to take us to what, maybe 2%, 3%, which is on the long term still a low rate. Does that sort of take some of the growth prospects out of US markets? So, so there are multifacets to this particular question, and I'll, I'll try and break it down in terms of the market's response as well as the real economy response. So first of all, on the market response, yes, Simon, you're right. It, it presents an alternative asset class and people can park their cash. That for me is not the main transmission mechanism into stocks. I think the primary transmission mechanism into stocks is the fact that interest rates are used as, your, as, the, as the risk-free rate, the, base, the basis to any valuation or discount rate when valuing a stock. Uh, is the risk-free rate, the interest rate. And so what you see happening is that when you're pricing a stock, if you're doing the, the, the bottoms up fundamental analysis, you're gonna say, now, this is my projection of profitability and cash flows. You take those cash flows and you have to discount them at a certain rate. And the rate you're discounting them is a combination of your risk-free rate, as well as what you deem to be an adequate risk premium on top of that. So how risky a stock are you playing in? Now, if you're, let's assume your equity risk premium stays static because that moves around as well. But let's assume that stays static. A move in the risk-free rate, by definition, still moves your discount rate up. And when you move your discount rate up, it means that your cash flows from the future, as they get discounted into the present, are worth less. And so that comes through in terms of immediate pressure, arguably, in terms of equity valuations. So that's the market's impact as, as, as direct as, as one can see them. Obviously, there are lots of elements at play there. The real economy impact I wanted to raise is yes, maybe rising rates in the US will take you to 3%. And it doesn't seem like a lot. But when you look at overall indebtedness levels in an economy like the US, in an economy like Canada, they are monumental. You know, debt as a percentage of household balance sheets and even government balance sheets are very extended. And so if you had based your mortgage on, let's say, for example, rates at 1%, and those rates then escalated or moved to 2%, it seems like it's a 1% increase in interest rate. But if you look at what that does to your bond or your mortgage payment, it doubles it. And so I think it comes through very quickly in terms of pain in the real economy. And that partially plays into my view of why I think policymakers may think that they can increase this a lot more than they really can. Because when the pain starts to manifest, they're going to come under some pressure or they're going to push the economy into a much deeper recession than they think they will. And that's a great point. I hadn't thought of that in the 70s, and I've seen the data. In the 70s, U.S. household debt was almost nothing. Um, and, and as you say, right now, it's a giant number. You and Naidu is asking a question around China. We touched on China, and I'm merging a couple of questions here because I'm cognizant of time. And um, we talked of China colonizing via the checkbook, and you showed the illustration of, of, of Africa and how that works, uh, the Bolt and, and, and Way initiative. Um, is, is there a military threat from China? And, and most notably, of course, everyone looks at Taiwan. Does, does this embolden does the Russia-Ukraine embolden China? Does it does it make China say, yo, hang on, let's step back? Does it change that dynamic at all? So, Simon, you'll know from previous conversations, I'm I'm not this rampant China skeptic. You know, I, I like to look at China with a very different lens, a much longer-term mm -hmm. lens. Uh, does it embolden China? Well, let, let's let's be cynical. Let's look at the flip side, like I committed to in the presentation. Mm -hmm. If you assume that China is intent on taking Taiwan, what has the current geopolitical situation in Ukraine and Russia done for China? I would argue it's shown China what NATO's playbook is. It's shown China that maybe, you know, you're buying aircraft carriers and, you know, you know, jets. Maybe you actually need to build up your defense in terms of your financial system architecture. Maybe you need payment mechanisms. Maybe you need your bilateral swap lines to be. So I think it's, it's shown China what the NATO playbook is. I think the US and China will play this little game and they'll dance around one another. Um, I, I think if you had asked anyone last year about what their preeminent geopolitical threat was, it wouldn't have been Russia, the Ukraine. It would have been China and Taiwan because China was getting very vocal around Taiwan. Uh, I'm not gonna go into, you know, again, who's right, who's wrong. 
I think the threats remain. I think we've seen what's happened between China and Hong Kong, for example. So I think some of those flashpoints remain. Uh, in terms of risk of an outright military escalation with China, you can't ever rule it out because you know that would have been the mistake with, with Russia, Ukraine as well. Uh, that said, China goes at things slow and steady, and I think they play a really remarkable diplomatic game. The question mark is whether you know the the international, uh, let's call it the, the 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 multilateral organizations let China do that. Already the U.S. is kind of leaning heavily on China, saying that if you support Russia in this, you know we're going to come down hard on you guys. So let's see. It cast my mind back to that NATO commentary late last year against Russia that was very antagonistic. With China, I'd be quite hesitant. You might have poked the bear, maybe don't poke the dragon so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I take you on that. A, a couple of questions are emerging. Uh, Howard was asking it and a few other folks as well. In terms of, of the US 0.25% of last night, is that enough? Uh, and a question, what do you feel is an equilibrium rate of interest for the USA? <laughs> I know, we've got that's, that's a big question. Um, <laughs> you say, you're saving the hard ones for last. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in short, 20, 25 basis points is probably not enough. So I'm, I'm not in the one and done camp. Uh, similarly, I'm not in the these rates go to 3% camp. You know, realistically, I think that you could probably see three or four hikes of 25 basis points consecutively. I think given the current tightness in supply chains, uh, in commodity prices in particular, it's almost as though if you go too hard, you push the economy into a stagflation environment in that hiking rates are going to completely destroy yeah. growth because it, it impacts you on the domestic economy, but it's not going to do anything to move the needle on some of the exogenous factors on inflation. Now, to a South African audience, this makes a lot of sense because South Africa often finds itself in that space where policymakers can hike interest rates, but if the drivers of inflation are exogenous, they need to be cognizant of that because you don't want to push your economy to stagflation. I want to raise a very important point here, Simon. Something again that I've, I've highlighted with you on, on previous shows, it's very important for the listeners, is that stagflation is the one environment that policymakers haven't figured out how to get out of. You know, the last time on a global sense that we had stagflation was the oil crisis in the 1970s. And the world went into that stagflation, growth was terrible, but inflation stayed high. And because it was exogenous, it was only solved through an exogenous resolution of oil prices coming down through a cooling of geopolitical tensions. And we run the risk of potentially seeing the world in a similar context over this current near to medium term. I hadn't thought of that, but yeah, we, we don't know how. We, we, we haven't got the playbook. Uh, at least in 2008, Ben Bernanke could be like, you know, we've, done, we've seen this before in the 20s, but we can, we can perhaps uh, 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 manage it in, in that sense. Uh, Denny, you're asking, retirement annuity is a place to be investing, is a place to invest for the long term. I, it, it, for for, for, for long-term investors, I mean, largely it's carrying on, carrying on. You've, you've got the asset managers. There's certainly benefits of retirement annuities because of the tax benefit of, of Reg 28. Mohammed, as you've been speaking this evening, and you keep on making the point, and I think it's, you know, we're so... We're so focused on the now, we sometimes forget to look up at the at, at the bigger picture, at, at the broader picture, at, at at sort of you know the the longer term. Uh, and notwithstanding the comment you've just made on on stagflation, markets are alarmingly adaptable. Yeah, alarmingly adaptable. I, uh, markets are a representation of of human resilience. You know, as, as as much as we go about and try and you know kill one another and 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 and, and destroy one another, you know, markets are inherently psychological you know there's the mon there's the monetary aspect of it there's the numbers the fundamentals but at the end of the day there's a huge and burgeoning field in behavioral finance it's understanding yeah. what's priced in and what's not priced in and i i think that's it's again it's an excellent perspective because we can talk right now about the hard data and what it's telling us but then when making your markets decisions you need to overlay okay well has the market priced it in or not so let's use an example of u.s interest rates if you look at what's priced into the markets, they are pricing in the five additional rate hikes that the mm -hmm. Fed has promised this year, or not promised or indicated this year. Now, what happens is if the Fed disappoints on that, it gives the market a pendulum to swing to on the other side. So you always have to look at that dimension to say, what's the psychology behind the markets? What makes they are surprisingly adaptable. When you are looking at your own investments, always apply a long-term lens that is relevant to your risk profile. 
You know, yeah. no, don't go out there. Everyone's YOLOing into equities. Go out there and be cognizant of your risk profile so that you can sleep easy at night. Yeah, and I, I like that. So you can sleep easy at night. That's always most important. And of course, cognizant of your timeline. Everyone's got different timelines. Some 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 folks in this webcast are 18. Some are a whole lot harder, oh, older. A question from Raymond. Um, and we keep on going back to a wall footing, which is not the fun part of the presentation. But nonetheless, does the U.S. debt situation, the U.S. has been sort of the global policeman and I'm thinking, I mean, Panama and, and all of those back in the 80s and, and the like, very much the, the, you know, then of course peaking with, with Iraq and Afghanistan, very much being the global policeman. Does their debt situation start to put a cramp on that and then of course open a window for Europe or NATO? I'm not sure about that. Maybe China or maybe open the door for despots in, in, in maybe more far-flung places who, who think they can sort of fly under the radar. Again, an excellent question. It reminds me of if you look at the U.S. conduct in Syria during the Obama administration, where he had said, you know, you cross this line, that's a red line, you know, and then the line was crossed and the U.S. backtracked. Yeah. And it's very similar in this instance in that we're saying these are our red lines. Uh, I think one thing you can't step away from, and again, using the, the lens of a long history here, is that looking at reserve currencies historically always correlated with the country that had the most powerful navy. So, for example, it's bounced around from being, you know, there was the Dutch guilder, which was a reserve currency at one point in time, and then the Spanish peso, and eventually the pound, and then was supplanted by the U.S. dollar, not necessarily in that order. So, I think the U.S. as the global policeman, that, that projection of power chart I showed you, still shows you that they are overwhelmingly powerful. Uh, China, I remember, again, a couple of years ago, China went and, and ordered a new aircraft carrier or building a new aircraft carrier and caused all kinds of havoc in the U.S. Oh, China's militarizing, they're weaponizing. <laughs> uh, but when you compare it to U.S. spend on defense, it was dwarfed. So I think for the near term, the U.S. is still trying very hard to project that power. This weaponization of financial markets is a projection of that power. It's because everyone holds U.S. treasuries, going back to the debt situation. The U.S. has the debt, but everyone else owns the debt. So if you go to war, you know, the U.S. could effectively wipe out a trillion dollars worth of Chinese reserves. These things take a long time to play out. Uh, and so over that long arc, I don't necessarily see an eminent demise to the dollar. But I do think that the U.S. in many respects is a recessionary global power. Yeah. And whether they take the corrective steps to change that and to enforce their position as the global imperial power, or if they are willing to cede some of that China, big question mark there, time will tell. Uh, but I certainly think that we move towards a much more multipolar world rather than what has been a unipolar world for the last 30, 40 years. That's not necessarily a bad thing, a multipolar world either. Yeah, again, different perspectives. Yeah. These periods tend, tend to come with a lot of tension. They tend to come with a lot of friction. Uh, you know, again, a lot of people tend to forget that when, when you cast your mind back to the Cuban Missile Crisis, it was the Russians putting missiles within striking distance of the U.S. capital, and now it's the inverse. <laughs> so we need to look at this over decades, multiple decades, and whether it's it's right or wrong, whether it's a good or a bad thing, is almost immaterial. What matters is how much friction is it going to come through in terms of financial markets and our day-to-day -day lives, and that's the one thing I think where longer term, the arc of volatility tends to escalate in these periods of change. I, I like that. I'm going to leave it there. And it comes back to one of the themes through this evening, which is around time. Peter made a point, uh, is greed not the root of all evil? And in part it is in war. I mean, war is literally somebody looking at somebody else's land and saying, I will shed other people's blood because I want what is theirs. And, and intuitively it's just one of the craziest things ever ladies and gents i'm going to park it there because we have hit time and i want to be cognizant of of, of everyone's commitments for the rest of, of the evening and in muhammad's case today uh there is uh muhammad's contact details you can get on the twitters head to his website uh, magic-markets.com is his podcast uh muhammad the comments are Absolutely exemplary. People loved the event. It absolutely was uh, uh, huge. When I chat with you, I, I learn stuff, which is why we got you on this evening. So really, really appreciate your time this evening. Ladies and gents, appreciate your time this evening. Uh, and everyone, stay safe. Look after yourself. And as always, say, if you can, look after somebody else as well. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Simon.